Luke chapter 1. I began a message last uh, or Sunday two weeks ago. And I also, once again, want to say a thank you, big appreciation to Clarice and uh, Clarice Starks and our drama ministry for last Sunday morning. And uh, I also want to say thank you to our church. You blessed us, uh, the pastors, with your giving last week and your gift. Uh, you are a blessing. We thank you so much for showing your kindness to us during Christmas time. God is good. God is so good. I am so glad. Wednesday nights, we've been talking about the church, being a part of the church. And God says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We need the church. I'm not just talking about once every now and then. I'm talking about being faithful to the house of God. We need each other. There's something about the presence of God. There's something, yes, you can worship on your own. But there's something where God says, where two or three are gathered in my name. There am I in the midst of them. I mean, you can worship, but there is something that when the church comes together, there's a dynamic that takes place that does not take place by yourself. There's a dynamic of God's anointing that takes place that he smiles upon. He says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We're two or three together. One can put a thousand to flight. Two can put what? Ten thousand to flight. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes that a threefold cord how strong that is. It cannot be broken. In other words, talking about the congruity, the, the, uni, you know, the, the unity, the worship that comes forth, and the power. You know, one guy can do a lot, you know, but, but what can two people do? What can 10, what can 250 to 300 people do under the anointing of God? I'm glad I'm part of the church. How about you? Amen? Luke chapter 2, excuse me, 1. And I want you to go down to verse number 26. In the sixth month, God sent... The angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. So Mary said, she said, how will this be? I'm a virgin. The angel answered and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Anybody want the Holy Ghost to come upon you today? And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Anybody need the power of the Holy Ghost to overshadow you this morning? How many tired of trying it on your own today? How many need something, something a little extra? Come on, amen? The power of the, uh, of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One, the Anointed One, Jesus, to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. Verse 37 says what? For nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. I'm a slave to you, God. May it be to me as you have said. And the angel left her. Thank you, Father. God, it's been an awesome day of your presence already through the sharing and of the different songs and ministry of our teams here at uh, First Assembly. Lord, it is just so good to be and experience your presence and to be reminded of the Savior's birth. But God, sometimes we, we let it be just an anemic birth. We, we just, uh, we, we, we celebrate it and just it's just become commonplace at times. But God, there was nothing anemic about that birth. There was nothing Nothing a uh, mere happen place about that day that Jesus was born. And nine months earlier when he, the angel was sent to tell Mary, Mary, you're going to have a child. It's not going to be like any other child. It's not going to be like any other situation. Matter of fact, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Even though you thought, I don't know how this can be because I'm a virgin. I, I've never had sexual relations with a man. But God, you sent your angel and said, this is Holy Ghost. 
This is the Holy Ghost is going to cause this to happen inside of your body. It is a supernatural divine seed that would be placed there in the womb of Mary and come forth the precious holy child, the incarnation of the very Son of God. So, Lord, today we worship you and, are ma- and we are reminded how awesome and powerful this drama is that we continue to celebrate today and we give you the glory. God, lead us now in the next few moments into what you would have us here and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. That verse, I, I, I don't have time to set all of this up from where... We were last week, and we, 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 talked about, we talked about the anointing, that the anointing makes the difference, the power. I want the presence of God, but I want the, I want the power of God as well. I need the anointing, the Holy Spirit. We talked about, how, about the anointing that even in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, it says it is God who makes both of us, and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. Somebody shout, I'm anointed. He set his seal of ownership on us. That anointing, when he, that word anoint, it's from the Hebrew word malka, which, and I I probably messed that pronunciation up, but it basically means to smear, to apply on. It's not just a little dabble, do you? It's not just a little praise on a Sunday morning to go out and be what you want to be throughout the week. It is a smearing that you cannot get rid of. It is a, an application on us, even as uh, the psalmist David said in Psalms 23, he said, Thou anointest my head with oil. See, that anointing is what makes the difference. Is the anointing that, that destroys the yoke of bondage. It is that power. I mean, we get saved, but once you get saved, you got some giants that's got to come out of you. Once you give your heart to Jesus Christ, that's just beginning. Yes, I know without a doubt the scripture lets us know that when I'm saved, it's by grace and that is all powerful. But there's things that still has to be changed in our life. When you get saved, you have an anointing of God to deal with every issue in your life. Okay, I'm going to give you, I'm gonna give you a, a, a thought here. You don't have to lose. Okay, that was, that, that was, that was, that, I'll come over here. You don't have to lose any battle. You, let, am I talking to Christians this morning? Come on now. You don't have to lose any battle. You don't have to lose any ground to the devil. Remember when David said, he said, who is this giant? Who does he think he is? What is he saying? These are the people of God, and we're letting, you're letting him talk like that? For 40 days, they would go out and, and, and talk, yeah, we're big. Then they'd run away after the giant said, send me a man. You've got to make a decision that I'm not going to lose anymore. You've got to make a decision that we are in a war and we have victory in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's the anointing of God, his empowering, his smearing of that anointing on us. He said, we are anointed. We're God's anointed. In the Old Testament times, there were three offices that involved an anointing with holy oil, prophets, priests, and kings. All three are descriptions and types of who Jesus Christ is. He is a prophet. He is our priest, and he is our king. And the Bible calls him the anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus, Emmanuel. He answered as Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. He's, he is as exclusively anointed as he was exclusively the son of God, the Messiah. Anointed in the New Testament, it refers to anointing of the Holy Spirit, the applying of the Spirit in our lives. The anointing is for everyone who believes. If you're saved, you've been anointed by the Spirit of God. It is not just a power of gifts, but folks, it is actually the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Isn't that awesome? The Spirit of God, the Bible says we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You don't work for it, you just receive it by grace. You can't be good enough, you just get it because you're a child of God. But the thing about it is, are we using it? Too many Christians are falling off the path. 
Too many Christians are falling underneath the attack of the demonic, but God says he set his seal of ownership on us. He put his spirit in our hearts, guaranteeing us what is to come. So he says, stand, make firm. It's from a right, a word that means to be stable. When the spirit of God comes in you, God says you're stable. So the word even says, remember what we said in, in Ephesians 6? I know I'm going a lot of places, but I'm, I'm going to get going here in a second. Stay with me. Stay engaged with me this morning. Let, let the Spirit of God speak to your heart today. When God says, when you've done all else to stand, stand. Stay stable. The only thing, application that comes to me, and, and, and it's kind of a dated thing, if you don't remember, and I've said this before. Remember the old curse commercial about the old little toy that says weebles wobble, but they... How many ever you wobbled sometimes and you didn't know what to do, but you still stood? Come on. You still stand your ground in the Lord. He may attack you, but greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Who's in me? Holy Ghost. And I've got a reason to stand because I've got power in me. I've been made firm. The Holy Spirit is in my life. It's Luke one thirty five. Then I'm, I'm, I'm going to share the scripture, then I'm going I'm to go real quick. Luke one thirty five says, once again, in the, in the message translation, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest hover over you. Okay, just follow me, Chris. I know you don't let me come down here, but I got to come down here. <laughs> that means when you're saved, wherever you walk, there's like this. It's like a hovering. It's like Toby. It's like wherever you go, whenever you're walking down, when you're riding the bike down with Mary and all throughout the street. It's like you can't get out of the cloud of the Holy God. Oh, come on now. It's like it's like you can't go without the hovering. It's like you've got it, you've got something that is going with you. Wherever you go, he's there. If you're in the heights, he's there. If you're in the lowest, he is there. Psalms 139 says, There's not a place you can go without the presence of God. The Bible talks about it even in Genesis 1 that the Spirit of God brooded over us. It's like a mother hen brings us underneath her body and protects us. Folks, when you're in war, you're not by yourself. Oh, I can't do it, but I got somebody behind me. I got somebody beside me. I got somebody in front of me. This means war, but the Holy Ghost, he's the one that fights the battle because Jesus says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. This Christmas I hope you see something totally different than you've ever seen. This is not some anemic child in a little baby form in the manger because that little child in the manger was the very son of God. He's the one that created body. He's the one that created Mary's body and her reproductive organs that could cause that reproduction. But that was not just a normal biology reproduction. That was Holy Ghost that planted that holy divine seed inside of her to enable her to bear the son of God without a man's uh, body body being a part of that because if it had have been then it would have been sinful and Jesus would have had to been have and, and there was but in no salvation Jesus was the perfect sinless son of God because man's seed was not a part of it okay let's even handle this when man gets involved in something that messes it up but when God's involved, all things are new. <laughs> See, your old way of finding is gone. Your old way of understanding is gone because the Holy Ghost is hovering over you. Holy Ghost is hovering over you. When the Holy Ghost hovers us over or us, there's things that take place. Somebody shout, I'm anointed. So he says, this child you bring to birth will be called Holy Son of God. Let me tell you what the Holy Spirit anointing does. Number one, the Spirit of God anointing, it will set you apart. You won't be like everybody else. You may not think you're like anybody else right now, and then people call you weird. Let me tell you, you the Bible says you're a holy, uh, peculiar people that's been chosen and set apart by God. That word peculiar in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, is a word that means set apart for his purposes. When you're anointed, you can't just do what you want to do. When you're anointed, you can't just go where you want to go. When you're anointed, you just can't think what you want to think. You can't just, just uh, 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 measly go along in this world like nothing's changed. When you're, come on, hold your head up high. You're anointed of God. 
It sets you apart, which you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises. Have you praised him like you're anointed today? I'm going to say that again. Have you praised him like you're anointed? Have you just praised him? Somebody ought to stand up on your feet right now and just throw your hands up in the air and just worship him because he is worthy. He is worthy. Have you praised him like you're anointed? If you're anointed of God, it'll change how you praise him. Come on. Hallelujah. He's worthy. He's worthy. Say, so, okay, you may, why are we doing this? The Bible says that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness. Do you think Lazarus praised him when he got out of the tomb? When Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And he walked out of the grave and said, loose him and let him go. And all we can do is give him a little tip, give him a little, hey, there you go, God, fist bump. You know, there we go, God, that's pretty good. Way to go. No, it'll change your life knowing that Jesus is your Lord. It'll cause you to praise him. Praise him is a, is a, is a, a, a weapon that God gives you that you should show where the praise I'm telling you, if you've been raised from the dead, would you just sit there and say, huh, no big deal. Huh. I'm alive now. Huh. Eh, no big deal. I'm alive now. I kind of think, this may be just me, but I kind of think, I'm alive. I'm alive. Woo! I'm alive. You know, I don't know. Hallelujah. I, I, I kind of think, see what the issue was as well. People would then go to see him, even at Simon's house, and Lazarus was there. It was making a major headway, in, and they not only did they want to kill Jesus, but they wanted to kill Lazarus. You know why? Because, I mean, what can you say about a dead man that who's not, not dead any longer? He's alive. Okay, what does that mean to us? Why are we getting all excited? Well, Romans tells us the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead shall quicken, raise you out of the dead and give you eternal, eternal life. What am I saying to you this morning? Some of y'all got brought out of drugs. Some of you brought, got brought out of a sinful sexual relationship. Some of you got brought out of uh, all kind of sins, things. And, and, and now you are a changed child of God. That ye should show forth the praises of, of, of him who has called us out of darkness. He called us out. Leon, come forth. Perry, come forth. Donna, come forth. Oh, Donna's about there. She's about ready. It's not normal. Because what's dead is dead. Not so with Jesus Christ. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. That same anointing that spoke into the tomb and said, Jesus, arise, come forth. Earthquake took place. The, the, the mantle of the tabernacle was, was rent in two. And people, that, people that are even dead brought back to life because of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you, when the Spirit of God speaks to you and he brings you back to life, old things are passed away and all things have become new. Let me tell you, a dead man can change lives. A dead man has been brought back to life. Aren't you glad you've been brought back to life? The anointing will set you apart. Let me tell you, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things, and he's put his spirit in you. Secondly, anointing will empower you to work for Jesus Christ, minister unto him. Remember when Mary said, I'm the Lord's slave. I'm the Lord's servant. Let me tell you, Mary was not to be worshipped. Mary was no different than anybody else. She just loved Jesus. She just loved God. And God chose her. She is not to be one to bow down before. She is not one that we're supposed to uh, worship. And she is not one that grants forgiveness. There's only one that can, and that's Jesus Christ. 
but Mary is favored of God. But the favor is upon us as well that know Jesus Christ. Anointing will enable you to minister. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 10, 6, the spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily and you shall prophesy, speaking to Saul, and prophesy with them and be changed into another man. It shall be when these signs come to you, do for yourself what the occasion requires for God is with you. You say, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know what God's will is. Just live life for the glory of God. All of a sudden, the spirit of God will rush upon you in Walmart and you won't be able to help yourself. Wouldn't that be cool, Louise? The Spirit of God will come on you, and you won't even know what to do. God says, whatever you find your hands to do, just do it for the glory of God, because I'm anointed. Let me tell you, I can't release you, but God the Holy Ghost can release you just to live life for him. When the anointed is on you, it'll change how you live. It'll change what you do. It'll change what you watch. It'll change what you listen to. It'll change where you go. It'll change how your direction. It'll change your perspective. It won't be half empty. It'll be half full. Come on, it'll change how you see things. It'll change what you see because you'll see what God sees. The anointing of God will set you apart, and it will enable you to do greater things than you ever by yourself thought imaginable. Wouldn't that be cool to live that way? Okay, how many believers in the house? Then why aren't we living that way? Why aren't we living that way? I am, glory to God. Why aren't we living that way? At this Christmas season, may something click inside of us and the same anointing that was on Mary to cause Jesus to be born. It's the same anointing that's been put on us and lives inside of us. And that's why I can say, greater is he when Satan comes in with the attack. Greater is he when he comes in. This means war rose. When he comes in, old things are passed away. All the other trappings that used to trap us. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Tony, you know the chains, don't you? <laughs> you shared with me where God's brought you from. Let me tell you, God is an awesome God. The anointing will set you apart. The anointing will give you ability to minister. The anointing, see, the anointing says in Psalms, Isaiah 61, that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news. <sighs> Every one of you, anointed of God, he gives you the ability to preach good news. He says this. He goes on. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. When's the last time we encouraged somebody and said, come on, it's going to be fine? Putting the oil of God around them because you're around them. Then he says, he goes on to say it this way. This is awesome. He says, to proclaim freedom for the captives. When's the last time we looked at somebody deep in bondage and said, be free in the name of Jesus Christ? I cursed that bond. He said, well, that's just, that's just kind of, I don't, that, I, that, that, I, I, don't, I don't know how to talk that way. How many believers in the house? Can I see your hand? You have the ability to say those things under the anointing of the Spirit of God, and you have the ability. You don't need preacher there. You don't need pastor there. You don't need deacon there. You don't need anybody else there. You have you and Jesus and Holy Ghost and God. You got enough. Are y'all getting this this morning? This is anointing. It is not some emotional thing that, ooh, I felt that this morning. I felt the anointing. Well, if all you do on Sundays is feel the anointing, but don't operate in the anointing, it's not what you feel that makes a difference. It's what you know, the anointing of God. Then he says, the anointing of God and release from darkness to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. It's time we start speaking prophetically into people's lives and says, God said this, his words. Prophetically is not just saying something they don't know. Prophetically is coming alongside the word of God and declaring the word of God over them and said, God is your Lord. God is your victor. God is your savior. The anointing will make a difference in your life. It will set you apart. It will enable you to minister. But thirdly, the anointing will produce fruit. There's people that say, I'm anointed, but they have no fruit. I love me some fruit. You know what's become one of my favorite things? I know you really want to know this. I'm going to tell you. One of my favorite things that I, I, I enjoy is halos. You got to peel them. It's a whole lot easier to peel those halos than anything else. This makes no sense to some of you. It makes no sense to really me at the moment. I'm just telling you what I like. But there's just a little work to it to get to the fruit. 
See, God has to do some work on the outside of us and to prepare us for his glory. But there's some things deep inside of us because it's been, God said, I deposited seed inside of you. You're going to get tired of this, but I don't care. How many believers? If you're a believer, you got seed in you. And that seed brings forth fruit, but you got to you got to water. You got to produ- not you don't produce it. God does, but you have to come along beside God and allow Him to grow that inside of you. It's not a feeling, because if all you had is a feeling, you'd base everything that you want from God on a feeling, and that's not always the case. Because there's sometimes you don't feel like serving God. There's sometimes you don't feel good about the day, or you don't feel this, or you don't feel that. Well, I didn't feel. Everybody else had their hands up. Everybody else was crying. I felt nothing. It's not about what I feel. It's about what God has spoken into my heart and said is so. Because faith is not about a feeling. Faith is about the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you're an anointed believer of God, God says there's fruit that's going to come forth. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. And, 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 and it, it is patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. I was riding up yesterday on the road. That's very dangerous, Interstate 26. And... Uh, so we was riding down the road going, going up to Columbia for the, for the funeral, my wife and I, and we were riding along, and all of a sudden, there's this guy. How many just loves and can't wait for the moment when people get right on your backside? Does anybody lose all patience and all Christianity at that moment? Okay. I'm just checking. I never do that. <clears throat> and I just lied. <laughs> Just irritates me. And then this guy, he just, I mean, he was just right there. And, you know, I wanted to check my brakes and just hit him, but I probably would have just say, back off, bud. You know, but but I chose not to do that. And, and all of a sudden, this guy just, yeah, just pulled him around and, and then got right on the tail of somebody else. And I, I just, you know, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord shined his face up. No, I didn't do that. point is, sometimes we let our emotions and let our thinking and let our actions stop the fruit that God wants to produce inside of us. God says, I want to put patience and gentleness. He said, I want to put things that like self-control because against such things there is no law. God, put that grace in us. Put that love inside of us. When you're anointed, that should be an automatic outcome that we grow in the love. We grow in the joy. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. We grow in the peace. The anointing produces fruit. i got to close. Fifthly, the anointing, it brings abundance. It brings abundance. God says, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I've come to give you what? Life. But he didn't stop there. And that more abundantly. Susan, would you come? That more abundantly. Team, would you come? More abundantly. Abundance. The anointing brings the abundance. How do you know that, Pastor? Remember the story in John chapter 7 when he spoke there that day at the feast, the the feast, the festival that was going on? And he said, any man that is thirsty, let him come to me and what? And out of his belly shall flow Rivers of living water. See, God don't want to give you just a little bit. God wants to dunk you in it. God wants it just coming out of you. Say, well, I I only need a little bit of God. Well, I think something's wrong with that. We need his presence. We need that abundance in our life. The abundant mercy of God, the abundant grace of God, the abundant love of God, the abundant power of God, the anointing will bring abundance. But I got to tell you, number six, the anointing of God will bring victory to your life. This means what? War. War. God's anointing will bring victory. Isaiah 10, 27, it says, It shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. 
Whatever is binding you today, the anointed of God can destroy that yoke of bondage on your life. You may be dealing with worry this morning. I don't know, whatever it is. You may be dealing with doubt. You may be dealing with sin. But God's anointing, his presence can empower you to overcome and fight every situation that you're dealing with today. Because no weapon formed against you shall prosper. It'll take authority over your situations. It'll lift burdens from your shoulders. It'll take away yokes that have caused you to say and do things and go places that you didn't really desire to go. It'll destroy the yoke. It, see, it's not just enough to, uh, to, 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 to just lift the yoke from your neck. You have, if you leave a yoke that's still on you, it can resume its previous position at any time. God wants to totally take that yoke from off your neck and destroy it in the name of Jesus. The Philistines, they stole the Ark of the Covenant of God. 1 Samuel chapters 4 and 5, and they, they placed the Ark beside their God, Dagon. In the presence of God in the ark, it caused Dagon to fall on his face. They, the Philistines came back the next morning, and Dagon, this, this, this stone god, was, was, was on his face. Because the power of God in the ark of the covenant that was beside it, it caused that, that false god, that idol, to be on its face. They set it back up. The next day, they came back again. You know what happened? <laughs> the next day, his head was cut off, and both, what? His palms, his hands, his feet. It caused Dagon to fall a second time. His head and his hands were caught off. Let me tell you, everything Satan plans to do, his head, and all the things he wanted to do, his hands, have been destroyed because the anointed of God that is in you, because you are the temple of God. No weapon, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. No weapon. But sometimes we stop there at that verse. Go with me to Isaiah 54, 17. Stand with me. The next thing says this. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Another translation says forged against you shall prosper. How many has ever been tempted by Satan? How many's had battles against you that you've lost? I could, if I could lift every part of my body, I've lost a lot of battles, not because of God's fault, because of mine. Now, this is going to take some real depth of character here and humility before God. How many's had areas in your life that you've continued? times to lose and Satan attacks in the same way see all the time how many don't ever have temptations can I see your hand yeah nobody just check it just just keep it real some of y'all didn't lift your hand on nothing I mean you act like you're perfected God, and there's not one of us on I'm kidding the Bible says here, no weapon formed or forged against us. What, what I believe this is saying here, Satan knows how he's seen our track record. And he's put particular things in place because he knows how to stop you. He's got your number. Not because he's omnipotent, that he's all powerful. Not because he's omniscient, that he knows everything. And not because he's omnipresent, that means he's everywhere at the same time. Only God is. But Satan is a purveyor of human people. And he knows how to form things and bring things in your life. I don't believe Satan can read our minds because he's I'm not, a, not omniscient. He doesn't have to read our minds because we give him enough information on our own. But he knows how to form those things. So, well, what do I do about it? God says, no weapon formed against you. No demonic intent that was put together just to destroy you. 
what may destroy you might not be a problem in my life or vice versa. But Satan knows how to work against you and destroy your life. But God says those weapons that were picked just for you. There's a lot of weapons, weaponry across the world. The United States have these millions of dollars of weaponry that now it's not just some big carpet bomb. These missiles can detect within a few millisecond, whatever you want to call it, feet, and go right to the target. Let me tell you, Satan just don't carpet bomb our life. Satan knows areas how to defeat us. He forms it against you just because he hates you and hates who's inside of you. But God says those weapons that are formed against you, about to be shot against you, about to be enabled by the demonic force of hell to go out against you, God says, don't worry about those weapons because they are carnal. And But God's abilities are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. He said, no weapon formed against you will prosper. So what does that mean, Pastor? When you go out and that thought hits you of demonic, God says, no, that weapon is defeated in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the anointing of God. You don't know what I've dealt with. Doesn't matter. That weapon that was shot against you, God says it's powerless. What makes it powerless is the mind of Christ and the authority of God inside of you to overcome that weapon. It's my choice. It's your choice. Then he says, every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. How many children of God, believers? God says everything that comes against you is destroyed and every tongue. Anybody ever had something spoken against you? Demonic or humanly? God says you'll bring it into judgment. Every tongue that rises against you, you'll destroy it. Every demonic word spoken over you, you need to speak against it in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? And I, I, I know I, for some reason God's got me laboring on this just for a moment. How many's had lies spoken to your mind this past week? Can I see him? How many of you took authority over that and said, that is a lie from hell and I rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ? If you, hear me, if you don't treat it as what it is, it will defeat you. If you don't treat it as demonic and say, oh, it's no big deal. When people speak into your life, into dreams and say, oh, it's not going to happen. You don't need to be hateful against them, but you need to in the name of Jesus Christ. If God gave me that word, come hell or high water, I'm hanging on to the word of God. Turn to somebody and say this, don't be a pushover. Be strong in the Lord. And in his might, in his anointing, you will do. Oh, keep on saying it. You will do mighty things. You will produce fruit. You will bring down Satan's territory. You will be used of God because you're a mighty man or woman of God. I'm anointed. Now, if y'all did not know this, which I think you do, but sometimes it don't just click for all of us, I'm not just anointed on Sunday morning. I'm anointed 24-7. When I lay down, I'm anointed. When I get up, I'm anointed. When I'm eating my whatever I'm eating that day, I'm anointed. Come on now. I'm anointed. We need to understand our life is a journey, and I'm anointed every part of my journey. I'm not just safe when I'm in this house. I'm safe in his presence 24-7. Last one. When you're anointed, not only will it bring victory, but lastly, the anointing of God will be evident. People will take notice that you've been with Jesus. That's what happened in Peter's life. They took notice. They weren't great theologians, weren't great. They were unlearned and ignorant men, the Bible says. But they marveled because they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. 
The Spirit's Holy Ghost anointing makes all the difference. It means courage instead of cowardice, contentment instead of murmuring, triumph instead of defeat, love instead of jealousy, prayer instead of prayerlessness, progress instead of stagnation, testimony instead of being silent, working instead of laziness, cleanness instead of defilement, holiness instead of worldliness, and Christ instead of hell. I want the anointing of God. Come on, lift your hands with me.